morning. Good morning. It is good to be here. It's good to see everyone here. I had a eventful morning here, so I really didn't have a moment to even sit down in a pew and prepare. Um, but everything's good. But I have a announcement to make that I was just informed about. And Doug Firm is very close to being possibly getting a kidney transplant, which he's been waiting for for a very long time. Um, and Melissa asked me to make mention about, number one, that, and pray that, you know, he, he does get that opportunity. But if and when that happens, he's going to be needed to um, transportation up to Cleveland about three times a week afterwards. And with Melissa working full time, she, it would be impossible for her to be able to do that. So she's requesting some help. Um, obviously, I told her I would be willing to, to go up as much as I could to help out. Um, but anyone else that would, able, would be able to help with that, see Melissa afterwards. Um, because I guess Scott is even going to be going in for back surgery, so he's going to be down, so he wouldn't even be able to, to take uh, Doug up there as well. So just talk to uh, Melissa afterwards if you're able to help in any way. But I also encourage prayer, because that's a wonderful thing. It's something that he's been needing, something that um, we're hoping is going to happen uh, sooner rather than later. But let's pray. We know God will take care of us as he always has. Now, this, um, this morning, as I get into the lesson here, um, you see up there the king's invitation. And, you know, throughout life, maybe at different times, I think a, a, a lot of times more so when we were kids, there may have been an invitation that you hoped you got. You know, maybe somebody was having a, a party and it was someone you really liked and, and you thought, man, I really want to be a part of that. Um, also, you know, even as adults, there's, there's times that um, we want to we receive invitations to different things. Maybe it's a, a certain event that only so many people are going to make it to. But, you know, this morning, I want to talk about an invitation that has been offered to the world. You know, we know in John 3.16 that for God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son. And we know that that invitation of forgiveness, that invitation of eternal life has been offered not just to those of us that are sitting here right now, but to those in the world. God wants all to make it to heaven. God wants all to be a part of His kingdom. And you know, it's, it's one of those things where, you know, there's certain types of invitations that maybe you have to do certain things. You know, maybe to get invited to a, a, a political thing or something along that lines, you might need to donate money. But you know, the thing about the king's invitation, yes, we need to be obedient to him. But the cost has been paid. The price has already been laid out there by Jesus. And we see here in, in Matthew uh, chapter 22, verses 1 through 4, and that's, that's the text for this, this morning's lesson. And it comes from a parable that Jesus taught. And that parable is the one of the, the ruler who sends out all these invitations and he wants his, his people to come to the party that he is planning. And, and we'll be talking a little bit more about that as we continue on. But in Matthew chapter 21, verses 23 through 45, it says, Now when he came into the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people confronted him as he was teaching and said, By what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority. Now in verse 45 of that same, pass, uh, same chapter there, it says, Now when the chief priests and Pharisees heard this parable, they perceived that he was speaking of them. He is highlighting their stubbornness and rejection of Jesus. So I want to look at this idea of 
the king's invitation and, and how important that really is. In Matthew chapter 22, verses 1 through 3, And Jesus answered and spoke to them again by parable and said, The kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who arranged a marriage for his son and sent out his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding and they were not willing to come. Jesus paints a picture of the kingdom of heaven as a celebration like no other. Now you think about that. Think about it from the perspective of royalty and, and a king that is, and has a son that is going to get married. Now even bring that down outside of royalty. Do we not celebrate when our children uh, find a mate and are married? Do we not celebrate when our family, our brothers, our sisters... You know, the king sent his servants to call those who were invited... Now, in, in this um, atmosphere in the first century, typically there were two invitations that would have been sent. It would have been a great honor to know that you were on the guest list. But yet, when you listen to this story here in Matthew chapter 22, it's really menial things that they come up with to excuse themselves from being a part of that. Now, I want you to think about that for a moment. I want you to think about Judgment Day. You've been invited. You have the invitation to be a part of the kingdom of God. Is there anything in this world that we can put our focus on that is more important than that? But yet there are so many things in this world that every day individuals give up God for. We see in, in Matthew chapter 22, verses 3 through 6, we see the rejection that happens. And he sent out his servant to call those who were invited to the wedding, and they were not willing to come. Again, he sent out other servants, saying, Tell those who are invited, See, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen, my fatted cattle are killed, and all things are ready. Come to the wedding. But they made light of it and went on their way. One to his own farm, another to his business. And the rest seized his servant, treated them spitefully, and killed them. You know, this would have been shocking to, the, to those that were hearing about this. Royal invitations were rarely refused. You know, think about you know, what that would mean. You know, it would be... In, in, in our life today, you know, we don't have a king or a queen or things such as that. But imagine if uh, someone in government, a high-ranking official, the governor of Ohio, the president of the United States, sent you an invitation and said, I want you to come to the party. You know, whether you like the person or not, it would be an honor to go. And, and you know, you, you see this type of thing happen all the time in, in, um, in life where individuals will go to a party, go somewhere that there's an honor, whether or not they think it's their favorite king or not. You know, notice the way the people rejected the invitation. Some were indifferent. And we even see in one case that some become violent. Now think about that for a moment. You know, I want you to think about something in this world right now that you cherish. That's not a trick question. There's lots of things in this world that we can cherish and love. And, and you know, whether it comes down to someone uh, that is a person or something that we have or, or something that we want. There's things that we cherish here. But are any of those things worth losing out on the kingdom of God? You know, this would have been insulting to the king. He had gone out of his way to invite the people and they continued to reject his invitation. Now in the scriptures, the relationship between Jesus and his church is compared to as a bride and groom at times. 
So I want you to picture that from that aspect of, of the church being the bride of Jesus. How did that happen? It was because he paid the price. Now think about what the king did in this story so far. He got all the best that he had and he prepared a meal. He, he prepared a meal and, and, and told the people the fatted cattle were killed, the, the oxen. You know, imagine today, you know, we have Thanksgiving coming up pretty soon. You know, we, we eat a turkey. Well, most of us do, I think. Some stuffing, some mashed potatoes. I, I know, you're, it, you know, it's not lunchtime yet, so I don't think it, this will be too bad to talk about. You know, maybe some corn or some green beans, some rolls, right? And imagine the person that, that slaves over that. You know, I can remember as a kid, my mom would always get up extra early in the morning. Now, I don't remember seeing her get up because I was always sleeping, but I knew what she was doing. I knew the amount of time that it took. They would, she would talk about how long it took to cook that turkey. Well, imagine if you put all of that work into something. And all those that you invited, in this case, mostly family and friends, and you set the table, you're ready to eat, and all the chairs were empty. Now imagine how the person that put all that work into that would feel. And you know, we have a God that tells us that He's long-suffering for us. So imagine God, and this is a, just a metaphor, obviously, but imagine God cooking Thanksgiving dinner for us. Imagine the Thanksgiving dinner being our salvation. God sitting at the head of the table. You know, thankful for Him, He, he could keep it all warm just sitting on the table. We wouldn't be able to do that. It would eventually get cold. But the salvation is there. And he continues to wait. The invitation is there. Don't give up on it. Don't lose out on the invitation that God wants to give. We see in the latter part of, of this lesson the response from the king. And we see here in Matthew 22, verses 7 through 14. It says, but when the king heard about it, he was furious and he sent out his armies, destroyed those murderers and burned up their cities. Then he said to his servants, the wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. Therefore, go into the highways and as many as you find, invite to the wedding. To those servants went out into the highways and gathered together all whom they found both bad and good, and the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he saw a man there who did not have on a wedding garment. So he said to him, Friend, how did you come in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the servant, Bind him, bind him hand and foot, take him away, and cast him into the outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. Now I want you to, to think about really what it was that Jesus was referring to at this moment. The, the picture that He's trying to show. You know, unfortunately, there are going to be people who think they've heeded the invitation and they're going to show up and they're going to be surprised to find out that they did not heed. They were not obedient to Him. The king brought judgment upon the people for the rejection of Him. The king sent servants out to invite a new group of people to the feast, people who were both good and bad. The king threw out a man who was not wearing a wedding garment. Can we go to heaven if we have not been washed of our sins. God is calling out into the world. And you know, the world is made of good and bad people. 
we're only truly good when we're forgiven of our sins. But we need to realize that we have a God. We have a God that wants us to be at His, at His party. You know, think about what that means. Everyone is invited to be a part of God's kingdom. Matthew 22, 9 through 10, we see that. Acts chapter 10, verses 34 through 35. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, In truth, I perceive that God shows no partiality. Acts chapter 10, this is Peter having the, uh, um, the meeting with Cornelius. But you know what? Peter tried to show partiality. Peter didn't want to go originally. God had to show him in a vision. That vision basically um, summed up to the, the idea of what that vision was about was it doesn't matter what someone is, it doesn't matter who someone is, if God wants to make that person clean, God can. Now, in the vision, he used the example of animals that were clean and unclean. But that was the point of it. We need to make sure that we take the right lesson for this life because, you know, we don't want to get to the gates of the party and realize that we weren't invited. We need to take that more serious. We must never lose sight of what is truly important. You know, what was important in this parable was showing up for the king. Matthew 6 and verse 33, seek first the kingdom of God. That's what is important. That's what we should have focus on in this life. If we do not, Even if we show up with our invite, we might not be dressed appropriately. In Acts chapter 24, verses 25, it says, Now as he reasoned about righteousness, self-control, and judgment to come, Felix was afraid to answer. He said, Go away for now when I have a convenient time. I will call for you. Just in case you don't remember what's happening there in Acts chapter 24, this is one of the, um, what I believe, three, three times that Paul expresses his conversion. And the reason he expresses it is because he's trying to convert Felix, who is a government official. We see that he listens to him. He reasons about righteousness, reasons about self control, points out that there's a judgment to come. That's what we need to, to, to focus our minds on that there is a judgment to come. And obviously, you wouldn't be afraid to answer if there wasn't something stirred inside of you. But unfortunately, he wasn't stirred enough at this moment. I don't really know what ends up happening to Felix as far as history. I don't know if he ever actually called upon Paul again and said, okay, I'm ready. I, I want to know more. All I know is this moment. I know that if Felix has not, did not rather, call upon Paul, he has no more chances because... Let's face it, there's no one around that's 2,000 years old, right? He's gone to his grave. Matthew 16 and verse 26. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? You know, unfortunately... You would look at what heaven is. 
And as Christians, we love that God sent His Son to die on the cross, and, and we want to be forgiven. We want to go to heaven. But unfortunately, there's a long list of what man would give up, or I'm sorry, would want to obtain to give up their soul. It's different for different individuals. You know, there are individuals who live their majority of their lives as sinners and become Christians. And, and live the remainder of their lives serving God and being obedient to Him. But you know what? There's also people who live majority of their life as Christians being obedient to God only to give it up for something from this world. What would you give your soul up for? I hope and pray that everyone here that is hearing this lesson this morning would say nothing. But I do know that we're a human and I do know that Satan is probably trying to work on every single one of us to convince us that his side is better. That the pleasures of this world that we may feel for a moment are better than those of eternity. You know, unfortunately, he doesn't sell it like that, though. He, he sells it more as this is just for a little while. If you are not at the feast, it is no one's fault but your own. We have all been invited. Revelation 16 and verse 15. Behold, I am coming as a thief. Blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. You know, I've been doing a study in the book of Revelation. And if anyone is interested in taking part in that study that has not heard about it, let me know. We're, we're doing it online. Um, it's the same as uh, our sign-in for our Wednesday night. We are usually there Thursday around 4 o'clock. But the reason I'm saying that is, you know, here, Revelation 16, verse 15, that's almost to the end of the book. That's, you know, 22 chapters in that book. But I want you to know that this type of language is all through that book. To repent. You know, we... Um, are currently looking at the seven churches of Asia at this moment. We have now gotten through three of them. And, and Pergamos was the, the latest um, congregation that we looked at. And in that letter, Jesus talks about some of their downfalls. Talks about the fact that th they're basically going to lose their lampstand. And, and what that really means is that God's going to walk away from the congregation. He's no longer going to be a part of it. It's not going to be salvation where they are. But Jesus, through the Apostle John, really emphatically just warns them that there's still a chance. He tells them to repent of what they're doing. And, and we see that language in, in, in just about all of the letters to the seven churches. And you know, the, the more I've studied this, just being in the beginning of the book, but just talking about those seven churches, I, I heard someone say, and, and they said that basically they feel that if you look at those churches, we could solve any problem, spiritual problem that the church has today. And so I went back and I began to read through those again and, and looking at those things. And and from the general sense of what is happening in those congregations, I think that's a true statement. That if there's a shortcoming that is here at this congregation between our members, if, between the flock, well, one of the things that we need to realize is Jesus is saying, repent. 
But I think we can see the visualization of that. In Matthew chapter 21, uh, verses 21 through 23, we see not everyone who says to me, this was, I read this 23 earlier, not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but who does the will of my Father in heaven? Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name? done many wonders in your name. And then he will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. One of the biggest problems in the church of Pergamos was that they were falling in love with the world rather than God. They wanted to make compromises rather than being obedient. They wanted to fit in with the people around them. And I want you to think about that for a moment because we live in a world where we're surrounded by people that are not followers of Him. That don't want to be Christians. That want us to change our viewpoint on on who we are. They want us to change our viewpoint on who is a woman or who is a man. They want to try to let little children who don't even have their brains developed decide whether or not they're the gender they were born into. We cannot compromise to things such as that. But really we see in Pergamos that's what they were doing. Compromising. I don't want to cause a fight. So as we bring this lesson here this morning to a close, we are all invited to a feast, a celebration that has no end. Think about that for a moment. Heaven, no tears, no sorrow. No pain, no suffering. You know, there may be someone sitting in the pew right now with an ache or a pain. And you may be sitting there saying, I want that to go away. There may be someone sitting here this morning that is hurting from the loss of a loved one. I want us to realize and think about heaven the way God wants us to see it. It's a wonderful place that does not compare to any pleasure that we find here in this world. In Revelation 19 and verse 9, it says, Then He said to me, Write, Blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And He said to me, These are the true saying." Of God. You know, we cannot come to the feast on our own terms. We must accept the invitation by putting Christ on, by wearing the whole armor of God, by becoming a Christian, submitting to His will for our lives. But I want you to think about that statement again. We cannot go to the feast on our own terms. And I want you to also think about the one that is putting out the terms. The God who spoke this world into existence. The God that created you. The God that could count the hairs on your head. Now for some of us, it might be a little easier to figure out how many hairs are on our head right now. But most of us, we couldn't do that even for ourselves. That's how well God knows us. So it's not this tyrant that says, my way or the highway. It's a God who says, I know you. I created you. 
and I know what's best for you. So will you heed the invitation? You know, as the song that we sometimes sing, all things are ready. Come to the feast. Maybe you're sitting here this morning and you're already a Christian. And you're struggling with something spiritual, something that is, is, is holding you back. I ask you to not hesitate from this moment. As Jesus tells the seven churches in Revelation chapter 2, well, the latter part of 1 in chapter 2, repent. Repent. You know, we offer the invitation on Sunday mornings for the front pew. But not everything that we do needs the front pew. Sometimes we need it more because we need encouragement. We need individuals to stand with us and encourage us. But if you have a sin in your life as a Christian and you know it needs to be gone, repent of that sin. Fall to your knees. Pray to God and ask for forgiveness. But don't do so if you're not willing to repent. Don't do so if you're not willing to walk away from that sin. Maybe you're here this morning and you're not a Christian. You haven't put Jesus Christ on in your life. We give you that opportunity. That if you're here this morning and you want to be baptized into Christ, you want to confess Jesus as your Savior, repent of your sins, don't wait. Don't be as, as Felix was and says, we'll talk later. Don't be as the other government official that, that um, Peter had, Paul had talked to. And I had his name a moment ago, and now I forget it. But thou have almost persuaded me to be a Christian. There's no one that's going to get before God and say, God, I was this close. Just let me in. We cannot go to the feast on our own terms. But we can go there through the blood of Christ and the grace of God. And if you're here this morning and you have any need, please come forward as we stand and sing this song.
Anthony wants to go to the feast. And he wants us all to go with him. He's got some struggles right now, some things that um, difference of opinion out, out and around him that have caused frustration and anger, and he doesn't want to feel that way. He wants to be a good father. He wants to be a good example. And at this time, we're going to pray for Anthony because that's what we need to do. We need to encourage one another. We need to pray for one another. And we pray that Satan will not knock him down anymore, that he will continue to move forward and he will do the things that God wants him to do. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we come to you in prayer at this time. We're so thankful that we can. Lord, we come before your throne this morning praying for Anthony, praying that you give him strength, praying that you give him encouragement, praying that he'll take that encouragement and your word and your